This is an eight iron and it's a dead shank. Wow. Way right. Oh, Take that shank. Hop off the puzzle. You gotta be kidding me. Very tough pitch shot right here. You gotta hit it into the hill. One hop up and bite and it's in. Kind of like that. Well, I would like to welcome to the Sub-70 Podcast, Golf Week columnist, Eamon Lynch, to the uh, program today. Eamon, thanks for taking the time to do it. I greatly appreciate it. Sure. Good to be with you. Well, uh, before we get to the Players' Championship, uh, you've had a couple <laughs> matches uh, against some pretty good touring pros with uh, Rich Beam and Brandel Chambly. I don't know the results of the uh, match with Beamer, but uh, can you give us a play-by-play of what happened on the golf course with, uh, with the PGA champion? Well, you're really starting with the painful stuff here, aren't oh, you, Jason? Oh, no. Oh, no. Uh, well, it actually, a legitimate match. It turned into more of a, a playing lesson as I was attempting to conscript him to be my latest swing whisperer. And it was all looking very good, but he had to be let go today for Twitter insubordination. So I'm now back in the market for a new golf coach again. I've only had five lessons or tips so far this year, so I'm... Definitely trending in the right direction. Eventually, I'll get there. So Beamer was more interested in on his Twitter account than than helping your golf swing at this point. I think uh, I was being used as fodder. He 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 suggested that playing with people as bad as me make guys like him feel good about their game. So at least I offered him some kind of service. So like he's yeah, I mean so like Beamer's got a better self worth at the end of. A couple hours with you, so we got that going for him. The Brando match sounded actually close, like it came down to the last hole, you know, so at least you were you were in that one to the end. Well, it was a nine-hole match, and he was giving me a stroke of hole, so I think uh, I had a reasonable prospect of staying in that one for a while, although he was confident he would have been smoking a Cuban behind the, the sixth green after finishing me off early, but it got a little closer than... than uh, he expected, but I don't think he was in danger of losing it too much. Well, and it's actually good he probably, you know, didn't lose because can you imagine his ego being crushed of losing to you in a nine-hole match? I mean, I don't know if he'd be coming back from that one. So probably it's better that you let him win. He can move on. It feels better about himself. But, uh, no, those guys, can they can still really play, can't they? There's a, there's a talent there when you play with a player of that level that, it just doesn't go away. They can they can still really really hit the golf ball and get it around pretty darn well. Yeah, that's for sure. It's, there's a definite skill set that does not erode with age compared to the rest of us, and they've both been competitively inactive for quite some time. But the the talent is certainly still there, and both of them, I'm sure, will play more in the future. Yeah, I mean, Brandel's talking about being competitive this year on the Champions Tour and what Beamer's a couple years away. So that kind of talent doesn't go away. It's fun to watch. But I was I was hoping you would have beat both of them. But, you know, like I said, next time you'll well, get them. Hope springs eternal. Exactly. Well, let's get to uh, the big event this week, um, Players' Championship. Sort of what's your thoughts on, on, the, on the tournament moving from May back to March? And what couple stories do you kind of find fascinating this week or, you know, something that you're going to kind of be pursuing or kind of watching as the week goes on? I, I'm definitely in favor of the move back um, into, into March. I think it gives a nice anchor event to, to the springtime, which had somewhat become lost over the last decade when it was in May. And it, it, it's quite interesting in how much change that's actually going to make to the golf course over the last 10 years. Certainly a lot of guys who would be deemed shorter hitters have been competitive in this tournament because the course was a lot drier and a lot more baked out with a lot more run on the ball in May. So we could see winners like, you know, Webb Simpson last year or or Matt Kuchar in in 2012. And that was really the only significant event in golf where the short ball hitters could reasonably contend with the long ball hitters on on a frequent basis. But we're not going to see that this year, I don't think. I mean, I was out there today. I walked the back nine with Rory McIlroy, and he was a little bit surprised at how differently the course played this time around. It was a little, it was breezy out there. There was a hurting wind, for instance, on 18, and Rory would always say that he would hit a driver sand wedge on that hole typically over the last 10 years. And today he hit driver six iron in there. Of course, it's obviously 
it's a little softer it's, uh, at this time of the year as well. It, it's certainly not baked out. So I think that may actually be the big change this year that it takes a lot of those kind of mid-length, shorter-length players out of the mix. I mean, they can, obviously, there are great players that can certainly contend, but I think it's going to be a, more of an uphill struggle for the, the Webb Simpsons and, and Matt Pitchers than it has been of late. Yeah, I think it's going to be interesting, too, if that predominant north wind, you know, is there all week of, especially on Sunday, boy, those those last two holes are going to be interesting with everything on the line, um, mm-hmm. 17 and 18. Uh, like you said, last year Tiger said he hit three iron, nine iron into it. Well, that's not going to happen this year. So the pressure coming yeah. down is going to be, you know, more old school how it used to be on those holes playing really difficult. So. I think that part's going to be interesting as well to see how does that pressure sort of mount with it all on the line at the difficulty of those last two holes. Yeah, and it's also the, the mere fact that a tournament of this stature, it's it's a lonely place to be out there on those last two holes, even if the weather and conditions aren't uh, against you. or it, it simply it erodes your confidence pretty quickly, that golf course, because the margin for error out there is, is so slender the whole way around. And certainly on those last couple of holes, 18 is a considerably more difficult hole under pressure than 17, even though 17 gets all the attention. But it's you know the shortest hole on the golf course, and it's the biggest green on the golf course. It should be a very simple shot for these guys, but nothing gets simple in a tournament of this stature on Sunday afternoon. Speaking of that tournament, there's the you know talk every year back and forth, should it be a fifth major? Should it just be a, a big tournament that somebody wins? What's sort of your thoughts on that whole argument on one side or the other? Yeah, I wrote about that this week. I'm of the mindset that it is actually a major championship. And so much of the dismissal of that notion, I think, is based on just rejecting the heavy-handed marketing efforts of the PGA Tour to persuade everyone that it's a major. But if you look at what goes into a major championship, look at the characteristics all of the others share. The first one is obviously the kind of the history, the stature. And well, the Players' Championship is only 45 years old, but that does confer some stature because that's like saying that the Masters was not a major championship in 1979 when it was the same age as the Players is now. And I just don't think that argument is particularly sustainable. It also has to have, for instance, an iconic course. Well, we've got that. It has a a strong field. The Players is consistently the strongest field you find anywhere in golf, major or non-major all year long and it, there's a certain you know memorable moments that goes into a major championship kind of mentality as well and i think it certainly has has plenty of those over the years there's no serious argument i think other than the grudgery about pga tour marketing to suggest that this is not a major azinger was discussing it with me at the weekend and he he believes there's four majors on the simple logic that you can only score four runs in a grand slam well, you know, we have the Senior Tour has five majors. The LPGA Tour has five majors. I Generally, I tend to think five is too many. But at the same time, I think there's every case that can be made that the Players' Championship ticks every box that would qualify as a major championship. So let's say, hypothetically, they count it as a major. Would you say that going forward, or would you have to essentially, you know, backpedal it and now Steve Elkington for example has three major championships would you establish it going forward or anybody retro would be considered those as as majors at that point I'm kind of agnostic on that point I think the tour might kind of going back if Jack and Tiger had the same number of players championship wins but of course Jack has them by one on that total but there's this notion that it somehow would scramble the history books and demand a rewrite is based on the questionable notion that uh, an unimpeachable list exists of achievements in majors because a lot of people, for instance, don't bother crediting uh, some majors that have been won out there by guys. I look at, um, for instance, Gene Sarazen is is given the career Grand Slam on the basis of his 1935 Masters win. Well, that was a, a glorified body gallery for Bobby Jones in the second year of the Masters. Jack at the 1975 PGA Championship and ever since has spoken of his pride at passing Bobby Jones' record of 13 majors. Well, that's if you include his five U.S. amateurs and his one British amateur. Otherwise, Bobby Jones has seven 
Walter Hagen won the Western Open when it was considered a major by all of his contemporaries five times, but that's not on his list of 11 majors that he's credited with. So there's really a, there's always been a, a shiftiness to that kind of list. And it's what's one more change to it by, by crediting these wins, but it's simple to do it going forward, obviously. But then, you know, a generation from now, we'll be arguing over whether or not Jack had 18 or did he have 21 with his three players or does he have 23 with his two U.S. amateurs in there? It's really just a, a kind of a fuzzy math situation. It's not something I feel strongly about in terms of past crediting because it's, it really has become such a, a, a bastardized process over the years in terms of what we do count. Yeah, I don't think I don't think I think about it, but you're exactly right on what the Masters first was when it started, right? And now those are all counted as victories. So yeah, I guess it's it's a it's a moving target at all points over the last hundred years. So could make an argument for it on that side. I can I can totally see where you're coming from. Yeah. Speaking of a man who's won a few major championships, I was going to bring this up, and since you were out with him, uh, Rory McIlroy, uh, solid year, yet to have a win. How do you like his chances this week, and, and how do you like his overall trend line of where his golf game is at, and, and would you see him doing well, and would you still think he needs you know a slight improvement with, if there's anything? I'm not sure how confident I would feel about Rory this week. It's, I asked him about this golf course last week at Bay Hill, and he said he's kind of tricked himself into believing that he likes the course over the years, which I think is true of a lot of guys in the field because it's not a course that makes anyone feel comfortable out here. And Rory, you know, I don't think he's got a, a tremendous record here over the years, but he's certainly trending. He's now five starts into 2019 and he's, his worst finish came last weekend with a T6. And I, I don't think I've ever seen him in a, in a better place with his game than he is. And even more to that point, I don't think of it. Well, he, he's been in a better place with his game, obviously, five years ago and he's winning majors, but certainly recently he seems to be in quite good form. But for the, between the ears, I think he's in a better place than I've ever seen him. There was a, an interesting moment in a press conference at Bay Hill last week when he said that he'd learned how to separate Rory the golfer from Rory the person and that the people who this was in the context of being asked about the Masters, which will happen now every day from, for the next month. Yep. And he said, the people who know and care about him will not have their opinion affected one iota by whether or not he ever wins at Augusta National. And so it's great that this idea that you can have a dream or a quest as he does, but he's not handcuffed by it in the way, say, you know, Greg Norman, I, I think in many ways, defined himself by his success on the golf course and therefore became defined not so much by the two majors he won, but by the, the ones he lost at Augusta National. And Rory seems to be going in the opposite direction in terms of his, his perspective on that. And I actually think that could be an underrated weapon going forward. And every, you know, there were some lazy comparisons to Rory after them and Greg Norman after last year's Masters, this notion that he was snake bit. But, People forget all of Greg's near misses at Augusta National came after the age of 31. Rory's 29. He could contend in this tournament for another 20-plus years. I mean, Ray Floyd almost won the Masters twice after the age of 49. So I don't think he feels any urgency or pressure. But his game is certainly trending in the right direction to get there in a few weeks. You're around these guys a lot. Is it, don't you think it's sometimes, and I get where you're coming from this, where they want it so bad that they can almost get in their own way, yet if he just sort of plays it off of, I'll, I'll go there, I'll prepare, I'll do the best I can do, and my life won't change one way or the other if I win it or I don't, I wonder if there's some form of freedom in that, that constant pressure, are you going to, to get the Grand Slam, kind of goes to the back burner a little bit, and he just goes there and plays golf. Yeah, I think that's what he's aiming for. He's actually said that, <clears throat> excuse me, that in 2015 and 2016, which were the first two attempts he made at completing the career Grand Slam there, that he felt he put way too much pressure on himself. And he definitely seems a little more relaxed now. And I mean, I, I just interviewed him recently at Riviera about the Masters for, for Golf Week, and he said he didn't you know, have a great warm-up last year. He kind of had a two-way miss going on Sunday. And he played himself into contention well with having something far less than his, his best game. 
Yeah, and then right if he can if he can be in contention without his A game, if he gets his A game, I mean like when everyone has seen it when he's won his major championships, when he's on, he's virtually unbeatable as well as he hits the ball and if the the short irons and the putting all come together, it's beyond world class. So it'll be interesting to watch this year at Augusta see, you know, can he can he get over that hump without like I said, the pressure has to be tremendous that's on him but it's it's always an interesting story to watch leading up into it so that's for sure um tiger new coach what are we hearing on that i know he was coachless per se last year do you know how this came about and how's his health overall i mean he was talking about a stiff lower back causing the neck to to flare up a little bit um you know how do you a for the players championship and then b sort of the rest of the the summer when they're gonna be playing a lot of golf what's sort of your outlook for tiger he seemed to be quite uh, okay with his health status when he did his press conference earlier today. You know, he said it was, it started to come up really as an issue in, in Mexico and it got a little bit tighter. So he was simply taking precautions with it. But he certainly, when he's on the range out here, he's not swinging in any way encumbered or slower because of the, the neck issue he had. And that's for the relationship with Matt Killen. I suspect it came around mainly through Tiger's pretty good relationship with Justin Thomas, who also works with Matt Killen. And right now, it seems that he's working on mo- mostly on putting with Tiger. That's all Tiger talked about today. There hasn't been any suggestion yet that he's really working with him on any kind of full swing motion, but more so Tiger thinking his putting stroke has gotten off a little bit over the last year or two. And Matt Killen had spent quite a bit of time around him because Tiger plays often with Justin Thomas, so he was familiar with Tiger's putting stroke, so he thought that was the logical option for him to get that second pair of eyes on it. But he's, you know, Tiger hasn't played very much this year. He hasn't played particularly well, but, you know, it's still a, a process for him to get back to where he was. I think the, the fact that he won at the end of last year, to me, is the most remarkable win of his career, given where he had been both physically and mentally. But I don't think we can expect Tiger to produce the consistency of results week in, week out that he did in his prime. I I would argue no one will ever play at that level again week in and week out. And he has skewed the expectation for everyone who's come after him, where if you don't win for three or four tournaments, suddenly they start talking about a slump, which is, is laughable in a sport where the win percentage is as low as it is in golf relative to the number of starts you make. He seems to be very much focused on the summer. Tiger's not worried about the events that happen in the year. There's there's really four events that Tiger really cares about this year. He knows those are the ones that will define his legacy. This week isn't one of them for Tiger. I'm sure he would love to win. I don't necessarily think it's the greatest golf course in the world for somebody who's as erratic still with the driver as Tiger can be. But, uh, you know, he, I would be optimistic that he can put up a decent showing in the majors this year. He. This is just an observation of a of a golf fan. I've I've met him. I've never had a chance to interview him. But the the tiger that we see now with more smiles and and engaging with the media and less guarded is 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 that something that you guys see who are out there with the tour all the time and you come across these guys all the time? Does he? Is that a pretty much a constant that you guys see that he seems like he's in a happy, good place in his life? I don't know how less guarded. He actually is. I mean, he's certainly become, I'd say, a little more relaxed over the last couple of years. He's not someone I've ever spent a great deal of time around. Personally, I know people who have who seem to think he's definitely had some kind of sea change in terms of his outlook on life. And I guess when you love golf as much as Tiger does, and the possibility, the real possibility exists of it been taken away from you through physical injury, it really does, I think, boost enthusiasm suddenly your love of the game again when you get it back and that's I think what we're seeing in Tiger is a certain relief that he has the the opportunity to write another chapter in his career because there is no way Tiger deserved to have a career end the way his would have uh, if he'd not been able to come back from those back injuries and back surgeries and I think it could be a, a remarkable chapter. I don't know if he's got another major championship in him. <clears throat> I'm, I feel fairly certain he's got more PGA Tour wins in him, though. And really, very few people would have said that, I think, a couple of years ago, given where he was. 
Absolutely. I mean, I would have bet you good money. He would have never won again after he would start, stop, start, stop injury. I, I mean, it's remarkable. It really is. I never thought he'd be a you know a top fifty player again in the world, let alone a consistent top twenty player. It's a it's a remarkable story, and it's a very interesting story. Another one that I, I find remarkable from this aspect is Francesco Molinari of, mm-hmm. and I'm trying to think of another player that comes to mind of this generation, say the last 10 years, that was sort of very solid for 10, 11 years on tour, European tour, U.S. tour, doesn't matter, then all of a sudden just sort of gets it and then goes to another level. And his game is completely transformed, it seems, in his mid-30s, which is doesn't happen as much anymore as it used to back 20, 30 years ago when those guys would hit their prime. And, uh, you know, he, he wins again last week with a remarkable round of, you know, at 64 on Sunday. And what's your sort of thoughts on him? And is there any other players that you can think of that have, you know, had a solid career and then all of a sudden, can, you know, taken it to the next level and not just done it once where they're starting to win tournaments at a pretty high clip and performing like that under the pressure of, uh, you know, some really great golf? Well, I think Stenson would probably fit that category, having hit rock bottom at one point where he walked off the course in Dublin during the European Open because Stenson did not know where, he could not keep a driver on the premises, didn't know where the ball was going to land, and he made a darn good comeback from that. What's interesting about Molinari is he's got a wonderful coach in Dennis Pugh, an English guy, and he works with Phil Kenyon on his putting. But a year ago this week, on Saturday night, Friday night of the Players' Championship, uh, Dennis Pugh and Molinari's caddy sat literally crying into their red wine. Francesco had already left. He'd missed the cut, and they had never seen him as low as he was in his professional career. He just seemed lost, wasn't getting what they were working on. And two weeks after that, he beat Rory at Wentworth to win the British, uh, the European Tour's flagship uh, PGA Championship. A few weeks, a couple of months after that, he wins the Quicken Loans on the PGA Tour. Then he adds the Open Championship, goes 5-0 and in the Ryder Cup. Now he's won again. So that's the fickle nature of this game. There's a guy who one year ago was as low as he could possibly be, and here he is now on top of the world. So it's, you know, it's, you can't legislate for that in professional sports, I suppose, and it's you know, you're one day, as we all know, Jason, one day you're the statue, the next day you're the pigeon. So it's you can be up, you can be down. And uh, Francesco was pretty down a year ago. And it's hard to imagine that it, he could be any higher than he is right now. But he probably thinks he cut out Augusta in a few weeks. It's hard not to root for him. He looks like he seems like a really solid guy, too. Like the way he comes across, at least on, you know, from what I see on television, it's, uh, he seems like a guy that the other guys really like. And he seems like... Uh, like a good guy out there so it's it's nice to to see him have that success um that's that's from afar from a fan standpoint of how i kind of see him they looks like uh the other guys really enjoy being around him yeah he seems a pretty relaxed guy and i think he's always been popular among his peers on on the european tour and certainly a lot of the stuff you saw on social media during the Ryder cup would suggest that was certainly the case too other storylines from this season I want to get your opinion on. We'll, we'll get you out of Dodge here. But uh, mm-hmm. new sets of rules that the USGA has uh, implemented and the PGA Tour has also obviously implemented. Is it blown out of proportion of this back and forth and the tour players not happy with it? As my first question, then part two is, do you think at some point the PGA Tour is just going to have a local rule or essentially make their own rules? Uh, as the as the pro game is getting so much different than the way us amateurs play, where eventually there will be some form of a biification at some level. I don't think the tour wants to get into the business of making their own rules. I do believe in bifurcation, and I believe that should be done by the current rules-making body, and I don't believe the PGA Tour has any stomach for any kind of split over the issue of rules with either the RNA or, or the USGA. And I think that was part of the reason why Jay Monaghan released that statement last week, kind of damping down the player rebellion, where they were making a lot of public comments critical of the USGA. And even Rory had pointed out in his press conference that the USGA is a pretty easy target in that respect. And frankly, to me, I think it is blown out of proportion because this would all be simple if the players would just read the damn rubric. 
every everyone else in their job, no matter what that job is, knows and is governed by the rules of their trade. Whatever it is, we all know what the parameters are we're required to work in. And these guys just don't bother to read the rule but they don't need to because in every situation where there's any doubt they call in Slugger White or Mark Russell they can't even go to the restroom without calling in a rules official for an okay and that has just made them kind of they're, they're soft in, in that sense they just aren't up to date on their own rules so whenever the rules changes and they haven't bothered to read them then they see the problem as coming emanating from the guys who actually changed the rules they should simply have to read the rule books and stop blaming someone else for their failure to do that. Their own apathy is the cause here. It's not USGA's fault. Uh, since you're in favor of bifurcation, without getting too far into the weeds, what, what, what rules or what things would you change for us amateurs or what would you dial back for the pro or would you let us have, as you know, as I, I design golf equipment, we could make, mm-hmm. every manufacturer could make a driver that's hotter than it is now. I mean, that that. 15 years ago, we could have done that. So amateurs could get more pop, for instance, out of the driver. You could make a golf ball that goes farther than the rules. Would you stop it now and let us kind of play with what technology is there and then roll the pros back? Or how would you see the bifurcation of rules playing out? Well, I, I don't think it will ever happen, but I would absolutely roll back the the, the equipment standards and, and the ball for PGA Tour pros and have a free-for-all as far as recreational golfers go. There's this notion, a scare tactic that's centered, put around by the proponents of greater distance that we're taking away the fun for everyone else. And I've yet to hear any credible person arguing for a distance rollback who believes it ought to apply to the, the 15 handicap who carries his driver 195, 200 yards. It's let them have as much advantage and technological progress as is permissible for them but when the game is played at the absolute elite level i do not think it's a fair trade-off to render obsolete every great golf course in the game which is frankly now where where we are at at this point that we can barely even hold an open championship on on the old course anymore because it's it's, it's a pitch and putt for so many of these guys yeah and i think it'd be interesting to watch some of the best players actually having to hit mid and long irons into a par four I, I, I think yeah. I think it would be interesting to see, you know, from 200 yards they have to hit a five iron, and how do the with a ball that spins a little bit more. I just think it'd be better television versus, you know, 480 yard hole and it's a driver and a wedge. Um, just from a from a fan's perspective, they'd have to play a little bit more like we do. So it's an interesting debate. Um, so for this week, uh, you, you've been out there, you've seen the changes uh, that March can do to the golf course. Do you have? a winner or two or three other guys that you think might be up there? I know this is a hard one to predict, uh, you know, historically of who can win it, but yeah. who do you kind of got for the week? I, rather than just choose a name, I would say just look for the guys who are heading at that combined longest and straightest, because the guys who are going to be able to pound driver and keep it in play out here, those are the guys I expect to be up there on Sunday, because the course is soft enough and it's going to be long enough, particularly some of the key holes with the way the wind has changed in March versus May. And, and frankly, there's only 24 guys in the field out of 140-odd who have ever actually seen the course in March versus May. And the last time they saw it in those conditions was 10 years ago, so I don't know how much of an advantage that is. But it's going to be the long, straight guys who can actually still overpower the golf course as much as one can a TPC sawgrass. I just think it's too much of an uphill climb for the guys who may be straight but short because this, no one's wedging this to death anymore. They may not be able to reach some of the par fives because of the softness of the conditions. I mean, Rory had a six iron into 16 today and the ball almost stopped in its own plug mark on the down slope in that front right corner of the green where they put the flag on Sunday. And it's that's how soft the golf course is. There is not a run out there and I think that's going to eliminate a lot of guys so just pick somebody who's long straight and there's a good chance they will be there Sunday afternoon it's going to be a great week I can't wait to watch it thank you so much for uh, being on the podcast today Eamon I greatly appreciate it and uh, have a great week while you're down there yeah thank you Jason